in. But uh, the key point is that in a specific protein of interest, such as hemoglobin, the order of amino acids is, is of principal importance and typically contains all the information necessary to produce a folded functional molecule. So we have this idea sort of shown in the schematic on the middle of this slide of amino acids being ordered and assigning a sort of numbering system um, to the positions in this sequence and moving forward to that idea that we'd like to find a probability model for the sequence of amino acids that corresponds to each protein of interest. So in today's lecture, I'm going to sort of spend some time on this idea of these probability models um, and go into them in some detail. Uh, and we'll always have this idea of sort of assigning amino acids or sequence elements to particular positions, and that will become key uh, later in the lecture. So where do we find all of these sequences? Where are they stored? They're stored in huge online databases. And so if we're going to proceed with this, this project of finding these probability models, so it seems clear that if we can find lots of examples of hemoglobin sequences from different species, then we can treat uh, this data uh, as sort of samples from a probability distribution and, and treat this as an inverse problem. So we look for a model that reproduces the statistics, the statistics of our observed data. So how can we find this data? Well, over the last 50 years, we've had this explosion in sequencing technology, which has enabled us to determine the sequences of huge numbers of biological organisms, and thereby also of numerous proteins. And when I say numerous, I really mean huge numbers. So this, the bottom of the screen, the bottom of the slide is a snapshot from the front page of what's known as a Uniprot database. And the Uniprot database has two components, one of which is called Swissprot, in entries, that's half a million protein sequences that have been manually annotated and reviewed. So they've all been looked at by humans individually and checked, essentially, to make sure that the, the annotations that are available are correct. And there's also a second database called Tremble, which, as you can see, has thin entries, which have been automatically annotated and, and not manually reviewed. So those have been computationally um, assigned to different protein types, essentially, um, but I think you'll agree 100 million is a, a huge amount of data. So all of this data is sitting there in these databases. Now, of course, what we need is a large number of sequences that all correspond to this particular protein hemoglobin. We're going to stick with this uh, infamous or very famous example. We want to find just the hemoglobin sequences, then we're going to have to have some way of searching this database sequences that are somehow similar. So we reach the idea that we sort of have a way of assigning protein sequences into what we call families. So we've sort of developed over the years this notion that there are families of homologous proteins where somehow the sequences that belong in a particular family have somewhat similar sequences. They're thought to have a common 3D structure. So the structures across the family, there'll be some variation, as we saw from those different examples of hemoglobin yesterday, but they'll be, in general, sort of at, at core the same, and the proteins will also have a common function. And of course, it's difficult for us to, to, to know what the 3D structure or the function is for these you know, 100 million sequences in the database. We certainly haven't characterized them all experimentally, you know, far from. Um, you know, we, we, we have something like 100,000 structures in the PDB, but that's a, a different order of magnitude. And so we really need an automated way of grouping these sequences into families. And the idea being that then if we can just group the sequences into families, that will imply or sort of make predictions about their 3D structure and their function. So if we can build a hemoglobin family, we can pull lots of sequences into this hemoglobin family and, and sort of annotate these sequences as being hemoglobin-like, then we'll be able to have uh, a fairly robust idea of their 3D structure and also of the function. So in order to do this, we need to have robust notions of similarity. 
We need to be able to measure similarity between protein sequences and also between 3D structures. So if you look at these two structures that I've superimposed on this slide, one is in yellow and one is in pink, you know, are these structures similar? They're certainly a similar size. They probably have a similar number of amino acids in them, but you know, there are sort of clearly differences, right? These are not perfectly overlaid chains. I've used a sort of ribbon representation of the amino acid chains here, but you can see that they don't coincide, but how different are they? And if I sort of start with this one pepsin structure um, from, as it turns out, this one is, is from a pig. If I compare it to the structures of a number of other proteins shown in pink in the pictures at the bottom of the slide, I compare it to human pepsin, I find that they're really very close, these two 3D structures. So they have a percentage sequence identity of 86%, or 86% identical, and they have an, what we call an RMSD, or re mean square deviation, between the structures of just 0.8 angstroms. In square deviation, we typically just look at the C-alpha atoms of each amino acid, and we align the structures, so we decide which amino acids in the two structures are equivalent. That's sort of a, a notion that, that we sort of give a precise technical meaning to, um, but it, and there are different ways of, of, of assigning that equivalence. But once we've assigned that, we can then literally calculate the spatial difference between the C alpha atoms of equivalent amino acids. And then to the root mean square deviation, we simply uh, square all those deviations and add them up and then um, compute an average, or the square root of an average. Uh, and we call this the RMSD. So the RMSD of these two pepsin proteins is extremely low, it's just 0 0.8 angstroms. Uh, a, we look at this second protein, which is from mouse, which is renin. Uh, this protein is, is sort of related in, in an evolutionary sense to pepsin. There are similar types of enzymes. You can see they still have really rather similar structures. The RMSD is slightly larger at 1.6 angstroms. Um, and then on the right hand side, I compared that pepsin structure to the structure of HIV protease. That's a totally different protein. Um, it just happens to actually have a structure that isn't that far from pepsin. The RMSD is only 2.6 angstroms. And when you're looking at these RMSDs, you have to remember that there is also some uncertainty in the crystal structure itself. So when we determine a crystal structure, there's some amount of noise, essentially. Um, this came up yesterday, this notion of noise in the data. Well, even when we're looking at crystal structures, in the electron density map, there would have been some amount of uncertainty. And typically, that uncertainty is something around two or three angstroms um, RMSD. So, uh, yeah, the structural similarity is, 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 is surprisingly high, given that these proteins are really completely unrelated. Professor, so, um, yes. what type of mathematical structures are used to model these proteins? I mean, they certainly have some structure uh, which um, might not be captured by those percentages that you're talking about. What has been done in this in this area? So you, so you mean if we're trying to model similarity between these proteins, then what kind of um, mathematical approaches can we use? Is that what you mean? So I'm thinking that uh -huh. there is some kind of algebraic structure for uh -huh. these proteins, um, how to think of them. Um, uh -huh. Yes, maybe. Sure. Um, so what we will spend some time on today is building, I guess, probability models for these proteins. So that means that once you have models, these sort of algebraic or models, if you like, for each protein family, you can then start to compute similarity in, in that space. And I think that is a space people have found to be most powerful. So rather than just looking at these single examples of each protein and computing some kind of you know, actual distance between them, uh, people have found that by building these families, these families of related sequences, um, by which we really mean sequences related in an evolutionary sense, uh, and then using those families to infer probability models, 
we then can sort of uh, define a more useful, useful notion of similarity by working in, in that space of models. And so I'll, I'll talk about that quite a bit. Um, so the first thing that we need in order to, to think about this sort of similarity is pairwise sequence alignment. To group sequences into families, we need to be able to answer the question, are two sequences related? This is really the most basic sequence analysis task that we'll come across, and yet it's, it's very important because it underlies building these, these families that are central to all of sequence analysis. We raise this question by finding the two sequences. Um, if you remember, I had that schematic with the amino acids labeled with numbers, which were sequence positions, and literally this means deciding for two sequences, you know, do the first amino acids align, um, are they the most uh, probable, uh, probable to be equivalent to each other out of all the amino acids in those proteins, and, you know, continuing the alignment along the sequence. And we then want to ask whether the alignment that we obtain, which might actually be the best possible alignment in some sense, does that alignment suggest that the sequences are related? Can they, is it likely they've come from a single common ancestor or a related common ancestor, or could that alignment have occurred by chance? So here I'm showing an alignment between parts of the hemoglobin alpha and beta chains. Um, and so you can see that I've literally taken these two sequences and I'm sort of trying to arrange the letters so that they have the most likely or most favorable correspondence. So here we're putting, we're sort of marking in the middle row of this alignment where there are letters, uh, it indicates that the two sequences have exactly the same amino acid. Where there are plus signs, it indicates that the two sequences have uh, related amino acids, by which I mean amino acids have similar chemical properties, similar physicochemical properties. And then where there's no uh, character in the middle line, it's because the two amino acids are quite different. So you can see that third position, we have an alanine and a proline. These two amino acids that we learned yesterday are really quite different from each other. And so that sort of um, counts against these two sequences being related. So somehow these two sequences, hemoglobin alpha and, and beta chains, they are really very closely related. You can see most of those middle uh, characters are either letters or plus signs. There's very few gaps. Um, of course, we want to define a, a more quantitative notion of similar, and we do that using a substitution matrix, and I'll show you those in the next few slides. But so here, there are many decisions where the two uh, sequences, or the two residues are identical, many others that are conservative, um, and that suggests that these two amino acid sequences are closely related. So in contrast, I'm now showing an alignment between the hemoglobin alpha chain and uh, a protein called leg hemoglobin, which is found in yellow lupin. And you can see that this alignment is much weaker. So there are a significant number of positions that now have no character in the middle, where the two amino acids are not similar. And in fact, there's also some gap characters that have been introduced. I've had to actually sort of move the amino acids along. There's not a perfect alignment anymore. I've introduced these gaps because there just wasn't a good uh, similarity match. And I could do much better at either end of the sequence if I introduce these gaps in the middle. So we do have this notion of introducing gaps. Uh, these are insertions or deletions. And when you're constructing an alignment, you have some kind of gap penalty. Otherwise, you'd open gaps all over the place. Um, and that's a parameter that you end up having to choose. But so these two sequences are related evolutionarily, but it's, it's a much more distant relation. Um, and the final example that I have here is an alignment between the hemoglobin alpha chain and uh, a nematode, a worm, glutathione S transferase homologue. And this is surprising because these two sequences are not related at all. They're totally different proteins. And yet, given that they're so different, they have a surprising number of, sort of identities and uh, similarities with plus signs in that alignment. Um, it's surprising, and we know it's surprising because the structure and the function of these proteins are completely different. So somehow, you know, just counting the identities and the plus signs isn't good enough. We need a better notion of alignment. Um, and basically, we're going to have to introduce some kind of scoring model 
in order to really assess the evidence that two sequences have diverged from a common ancestor by a process of mutation and selection. And so I found this nice cartoon on, uh, on the internet which sort of illustrates this process, which of course you will have heard lots and lots about in the school so far, but essentially there are some random mutations that change particular base pairs, um, or in this case they're, they're sort of indicating alleles, you can think of them as just changing a particular base pair, and that leads to an individual with a new genotype, which might have a, a protein with an amino acid substitution, and um, which might well change the ability of the individual to survive um, in the environment. So we're trying to assess were these two sequences um, generated from a common ancestor by this kind of process, or is there just some random similarity? And so we need to take into account the different ways in which point mutations can occur. So there can be silent mutations, which in protein sequences we'll never see, right? This third position where the T changes to an A does still results in a lysine. And there'll be nonsense mutations where you mutate to, for example, a, a stop codon. So you might have a frame shift, which totally messes up the sequence. Um, and then there are these missense mutations where you get an amino acid change. Um, and so there are examples shown here of a conservative uh, mutation and a non conservative mutation. Uh, we're going from lysine to arginine, they're both positively charged amino acids, so you might expect that not to disrupt the protein too much. I mean, there are differences, but they're pretty similar. Um, on the other hand, uh, lysine to threonine is uh, really quite a significant change. So... A kind of naive yeah. question. When, when these point mutations happen, uh -huh. they happen at both uh -huh. sides of the strand? Um, in DNA, no, at least? I mean, for... No, not necessarily, because typically you'll have two different alleles, right? Um, so you'll have the mutation just in one of the positions, not in the corresponding other position. Right, so you just have that single base pair in one side of the DNA. Does that make sense? Are they still compatible? If, if one um, well, it, 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 it could well mess up um, the base pairing. Yeah. Um, but uh, luckily, you know, on both sides, you're going to have this perfect sort of um, stretch of, of DNA. So I don't think it's going to make too much of a difference to the overall structure. Excuse me. Um, but yes, yeah, so we have these substitutions which can be synonymous or non-synonymous, whether it results in a protein coding change or not. But then we also have indels. So here we are illustrating this slide an in insertion where some extra. Sorry, Lucy, there is another yeah. question. Yeah, of course, please. Oh, I can't hear. It. Sorry. Oh. So thanks. Sorry. Two chromosomes, oh. right, in a cell. So any mutation. Your DNA repair will make it compatible. So on the same chromosome, it will be compatible. But you have two different chromosomes, and that's what she's talking about, about alleles. So your question is, the answer is yes, the DNA repair will make them compatible on the same homology, same chromosome. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Thank um, you. Yeah, so we have these insertions where you have a whole extra chunk of DNA inserted between the existing um, sequence. Uh, so in this case, actually, somehow, uh, these two additional amino acids were inserted. And that's right, I think it's all two or even, yeah, so the T and the Y have been added. Um, likewise, you could also have sections of DNA that were removed. Right, in a deletion event. They all have um, changes, essentially, in the DNA. And so in this case, this insertion has uh, resulted in an extra loop in this protein that uh, wasn't there previously. Um, and so 
We need a, a scoring model that allows or takes account of all of those possible uh, mutation events. Um, so we're essentially going to aim for a model that has a term for each pair of uh, aligned residues and also terms for any gaps that are introduced. And basically, uh, the score will correspond to the log of the relative likelihood that the sequences are related compared to being unrelated. And so sort of thinking about it informally, we expect identities and conservative substitutions to be more likely in alignment than we accept by chance. And so to contribute positive score terms, so here this sort of green circle, this match, and this little toy example is, is going to contribute positively to my score. Um, I think I've assigned it something like a plus five in the, in the schematic below. Then non-conservative changes or mismatches are going to uh, we expect them to observe to be observed less often in real alignments than we expect by chance. So they're going to contribute negative score terms. So here, this mismatch in the CNT might give us a negative three. And then uh, we also have to somehow we have, we're going to allow this notion of gaps shown in blue, but we need to penalise gaps. Otherwise, we'd never have a mismatch. We'd always just introduce gaps until we could match things perfectly, and we end up with these horrendously overly gapped alignments, which are not particularly useful. So we need a penalty for the gaps, and in this scheme, we might make it something like minus eight. And using this kind of additive scoring scheme corresponds to an important assumption, and that's the assumption that we can consider mutations at different sites in a sequence to have occurred independently. And we basically treat a gap of arbitrary length as a single mutation. And this assumption is made throughout a, nearly all of computational biology, and yet we know that this assumption can't be true. Right? We know that in the structure of the protein, amino acids that are far apart in sequence end up next to each other in a 3D structure, and so if there's an, an, a mutation at one of those amino acids, it, it likely affects mutations or the, the changes that could occur at surrounding amino acids that are close in structure but not close in sequence, and so um, it's clear that at some level this assumption must be wrong. And in fact, it's even clearer in RNA uh, sequences that this assumption can't be true because for RNA uh, secondary structure, we need to basically respect base pairing, which introduces uh, interactions between uh, residues or base the nucleotides that are far apart in sequence and end up base paired to each other in structure. Um, and so people have uh, worked on algorithms that, that, that don't make that assumption extensively uh, in the field of RNA secondary structure prediction in particular. But for now, with these basic scoring models, we're going to stick with this assumption. And so in order to score the different aligned residue pairs, we need some kind of substitution matrix. Now, I've given you kind of a lot of intuition for proteins, uh, similarity between the different amino acids, and so you could, in principle, actually just invent a substitution matrix, right? You'd probably give... Oh, yeah. yes, please. Um, I have a question, just a previous slide. Uh, yeah, sure. Um, how, how did you get this uh, scores? I mean, plus five, minus three. Uh, is it the logarithm of the likelihood values? I mean, could you please explain? So these, uh, these basically, yes, I'm going to explain that to you in the next few slides, actually. Yeah. Basically, yes, but I will, I'll explain it, I'll go through it, and then it, it is exactly what I'm going to go through in the next few slides. Okay, okay, fine. Where you would get these, 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 these numbers from. Yeah. Thank you. It's a good question. Um, so we need the substitution matrix. Basically, the substitution matrix is going to contain these numbers. Um, we could just sort of invent them. We could have a heuristic where we say, well, you know, D and E, these amino acids, spartic acid and glutamic acid are very similar. So I expect to see changes between them even in related proteins. And, you know, I could, I could basically come up with these 210 numbers, but it's useful to have some kind of guiding theory for what these scores mean. And so what we really mean is if we have two protein sequences, X and Y, where we have X1 to 5, these amino acids, and Y1 to 5. And we want to compare a random model, so that's the probability of X and Y 
given random will just be the product you know, all occurring independently, a product of the sort of random frequencies of amino acids. So, you know, the fact that we have X1 and Y1 both in the first position is just because, you know, we see X1 a 20th of the time and we see Y1 a 20th of the time, and that would be the probability. We want to compare that with what I'm going to call a match model, which is the probability, which basically says that aligned pairs of residues occur with a joint probability P A B, so in this case P X1, Y1, and that's the probability that the residues X1 and Y1 have each independently been derived from some unknown original residue, could be Z1, in their common ancestor. And of course, Z1 might be equal to X1 or Y1. Right? So we want to compare these two models, random chance and the idea that these sequences came from the same common ancestor. And so we're going to compare them by simply taking the ratio of these probabilities, which works out if we just rewrite that equation to just be the product of the px1 y1s divided by the qx1s times the qy1s. And if we consider the logarithm of these terms, then this leads us to a score, capital S, given by the sum of the score for each aligned pair. Uh, that score is just the logarithm of that probability ratio. So it's a log likelihood ratio that the pair AB is an aligned or matched pair versus uh, that it occurred at random. So that's exactly, I think, uh, the suggestion that, that you were alluding to, this log likelihood ratio. And we end up with these substitution matrices that are, that are sort of people derived, I guess, 40 or 50 years ago now, it must be. I think it's that long ago. Um, this is the Blossom 50 matrix, which is just a particular substitution matrix. Uh, it's called 50 because it was constructed from a set of sequences that were divided into blocks that were 50% different. I'll say a little bit more about that on the next slide, but essentially it's trying to uh, model a certain evolutionary distance. So if your sequences are sort of roughly 50% identical to each other, this would be a good choice of matrix. This would sort of tell you the substitution frequencies you'd expect um, for sequences that are that diverged. If your sequences are very, very closely related in an evolutionary sense, then you see different patterns. So there's a version of this matrix called the Blossom 90 matrix, um, which has different numbers in it, essentially, because uh, it reflects the kind of substitution you see between sequences that are very close to each other. So we're just trying to capture uh, some version of reality. And I've highlighted a few entries in this matrix. So the charged amine column, that's a positively charged amino acid. You can see that it has a positive uh, score in the row corresponding to K. That's lysine, which is also a positively charged amino acid. So somehow that positive score is telling us that the changing in R for a K is a conservative substitution. You'd expect to see that in, in closely related proteins. Um, changing in R for an H, so histidine is also positively charged, gets a zero. So it's sort of neither good nor bad. And that's because histidine is quite different from arginine, even though they're both positively charged. If we look at the score for R and D as a spartic acid, that's a negatively charged amino acid, it's a minus two. Uh, in a sense, charged amino acids are all quite similar to each other because they're, they're hydrophilic and they're quite large. Um, so even though that, that actually changes the charge, that, that substitution, it's still not as unlikely as the mutation from R to C to cysteine, which is, gets a minus four score. So all of these numbers basically um, have a meaning. They're telling us about how likely these substitutions are. And to construct this matrix, basically a set of aligned ungapped regions from protein families were assembled and they were clustered so that two sequences go in the same cluster if they're more than 50% identical. So you basically make these large clusters of sequences and, and then basically we, we, we use those, we use this, the, the frequencies of substitutions that we see within those blocks and, and between those blocks 
uh, to calculate those scoring, the, the mit scores in that matrix. And once we have the scoring model, then of course we need to find the optimal alignment between two sequences. So we have these scores for all of the possible amino acid um, pairings, and we need to take our two sequences and line them up. And if we're going to allow gaps in this alignment, then there's a large number of possible alignments. There's 2n choose n possible global alignments between two sequences of length n. And I've used basically a science approximation to write that as 2 to the 2n divided by the root of pi times n. And 2 to the 2n, of course, grows quickly. Um, so that even for moderate values of n, it's not computationally feasible to enumerate all of these alignments. But luckily, we're rescued by various. Is there a question? Yeah. Uh, oh, what yes, is, thanks. Yeah, what is the difference between optim optimal alignment and global alignment? Uh, so, global alignment just means you're aligning the whole sequence. So, a global alignment means I have two sequences of length n, and I'm going to align the whole sequences. I'm not. And the other option is a local alignment, where I'm just going to align subsequences. I'm not going to worry about aligning the whole sequence. Okay. So, so there are two different um, approaches, if you like. Optimal alignment just means the alignment with the highest score. So whatever scoring method I've decided to use, I want to find the alignment that has the highest score. Okay. And I have to decide if I'm doing a global alignment or a local alignment. Does okay. that make sense? Uh, yeah. So uh, for the optimal alignment, I had a question. Means, uh, uh, how, <laughs> how how do you go on to define this score itself? I mean, at the biological level, uh, what is that? I mean, uh, the the um, hoxtein pair bonding is more something. Uh, I'm thinking on that line. I mean. Well, hey, what do you mean? So. So. Uh, how how do you define optimal alignment? I mean, you have high score values, okay? So mm -hmm. then again, how do you define high high score values? So literally, I, I mean, I've defined a scoring scheme, right? So I, I have my substitution matrix. I have a gap penalty, and um, so I now have a score for every possible um, uh, move, if you like. And I start at one side of the sequence, and I start, you know, putting aligning amino acids. So I'm literally just trying to say, are these two amino acids at these positions in the sequence equivalent? Mm -hmm. Do they come from a, the same common ancestor, or should I actually introduce a gap here instead? Right. So I'm just trying to take these two sequences and line them up. And I've, I've defined this, this, this scoring model, and when I say optimal alignment, it just means I want to maximize that score. Okay. Okay. Thank you. So it's, it's sort of saying, if I was to take these two proteins and superimpose them, Right? Should these two amino acids, will they fall close to each other, or should they be in different parts? Will they sort of end up in different places? So, so that's one way of thinking about it. Um, but I'm basically trying to just um, define a mapping between these two proteins, uh, in, this, in, this, in this case, at the sequence level. So I also could perform a structural alignment if I had the two structures, um, and then I'd be trying to ask, um, by take these two 3D objects, what's the way that I can best superimpose them so that they're optimally aligned? And that's a, a different problem. And in the sequence problem, it, it's, it's sort of very closed. I have this scoring model I've defined, um, and I just want to optimize that score. Um, and so there are these two main dynamic programming algorithms that people uh, have developed. And they provide an efficient way of finding the optimal algorithm. And basically, the idea is to start from an existing smaller alignment and evaluate all possible next moves. And so um, the needleman Wunsch algorithm is what people use to align whole sequences, and Smith-Waterman algorithm differs slightly, and that's what people use to align subsequences. And I'm not going to go into detail about those alignments uh, algorithms, but they are uh, quite simple, actually. And um, you know, interesting to look up um, from a sort of computer programming point of view. But of course, this is pairwise alignment. What we really want is multiple sequence alignment. Right? I want to align large sets of sequences, not just pairs of sequences. I could do all pairs, um, but then I'd have sort of still have a big problem of how to resolve all of the pairwise alignments. And what I really want is one big alignment. And this is a small section of a hemoglobin alignment. And what you can see, what's marked above 
each row of this alignment is where the helices are. Um, and so you see that sort of secondary structure provides some important information that you can take into account when performing uh, a multiple sequence alignment. Because sort of biologically, what we mean by equivalence between these two proteins is, you know, sort of, in a sense, are these residues in the same helix? I number the helices one, one to eight. Uh, I want helix one in these two proteins to line up and helix two to line up and so on and so forth. And so that ends up being quite important. Um, so the key approach when it comes to building multiple sequence alignments uh, involves hidden Markov models. So hidden Markov models are discrete time finite state Markov chains uh, coupled with a sequence of letters that's emitted when the Markov chain visits its states. So essentially, uh, this Markov chain jumps from state to state, and at each state, a letter, so a base pair or an amino acid, is emitted by the Markov chain. And this sequence, O in this case of emitted letters, is called the observed sequence. Um, and we typically know that observed sequence, we're trying to align these sequences that we have, but what we don't know is a state sequence Q underneath, and that's what we call hidden. And these models are completely central to computational biology. They're used everywhere. They're basically used for labeling data, and in particular for classifying and aligning protein sequence data. But any example where you want to assign labels to particular pieces of data, you'll likely find people have tried using a hidden Markov model. So I'm going to sort of walk through a nice primer that Sean Eddy published uh, back in 2004, uh, describing what a hidden Markov model is. And he uses this simple example where you have to imagine a five prime splice site recognition problem. So we're going to assume we're given a DNA sequence that begins in an exon. It contains one five prime splice site and then it ends in an intron. And the problem is to identify where the switch from exon to intron occurred, in other words, where that five prime splice site is in the sequence. So we can straight away write down a hidden Markov model for this problem. So this hidden Markov model has three states. There's the exon state, the five prime splice site state, and the intron state, and we've assigned here some probabilities for moving between these states. So we start, and we know that the first thing is going to be an exon, so that has a probability of one, and then you might stay in this exon state. In fact, you have a probability of 0.9 of staying in that exon state as you make this hidden, as this Markov chain jumps. But then at some point, you'll move to the five prime splice site, and that has a probability of 0.1, and you only have one of those, so as soon as you visit that state, you then move to the intron state, and then you'll have some number of, um, spend some time in that intron state before the uh, sequence ends. So, to estimate which state each element of a DNA sequence is in, so we have, a, we have I imagine we have this DNA sequence, and we want to assign the nucleotides in that sequence to these states, we need some information about the statistics of exon splice sites and intron sequences. And these statistics are the emission probabilities of our hidden Markov model. So I'm going to add some emission probabilities to this diagram. So basically, if you're in an exon state, the chances are completely equal that you emit an A, C, G, or T. There's no bias. So that has a, a uniform probability over those four states. In contrast, if you're in the five prime splice site state, then it's extremely likely you'll emit a G. And there's no like probability at all that you'll emit a C or a T, and there's a very small probability you'll emit an A. And then in the intron state, there's sort of a different distribution again, where you're more likely to emit A's and T's, and less likely to emit C's and G's. So now we know something about the, the letters that are likely to be emitted by these hidden Markov model states. 
we can sort of turn the problem around and ask if I have a particular DNA sequence, what state uh, was each sequence position generated by? So if we look at that sequence which are now added to this diagram, I have CTTCAT as my first six nucleotides, and I want to uh, consider uh, the possible states that they could have been generated by. And if I look at my hidden Margot model, I see straight away that the 5 prime splice site never emits a C or a T. So I know that the CTTC at the start of the sequence, they must all have been generated from the exon state that I've started in. Okay, so that's why there are some sort of uh, possible uh, paths, if you like, shown in green and pink underneath this diagram. And all of them start with a block of E's in the state path. So this is a hidden uh, state that I'm trying to infer in my hidden Markov model. We're only given this observed sequence, the underlying state path is hidden. Um, so that's the, the hidden Markov chain. And of course, it's a Markov chain, of course, the state that we go to next only depends on the state that we're currently in. It doesn't depend on the history. So this is this toy hidden Markov model. The probability, uh, which, yeah, I think I put this on the next slide. So the probability P of S and pi, given the hidden Markov model of theta, so we've got this hidden model, Markov model with parameters theta, and we've got the probability that it generates the state path pi and the observed sequence s. is simply the product of all the emission probabilities and the transition probabilities that were used. So this sequence has 26 nucleotides, so there's 27 transitions and 26 emissions that take place as we move through that sequence, and we simply take the product of these 53 probabilities and in fact, we typically take the log of the product just because the numbers are small, and uh, we can compute that for different possible paths uh, through that sequence. So the state path that I've shown on the slide has a log probability of minus 41.22, and you can see some other possible state paths below, where the five prime splice site is in different places, and they have uh, associated probabilities that you've literally just computed using the emission probabilities and the transition probabilities shown in the diagram. And this is all sort of very straightforward, and you end up with these different log probabilities, and the goal is to find the path, state path, with uh, the highest probability. So there are 14 possible paths through this model that have non-zero probability. And that's basically because the five prime splice site has to either be an A or a G, right? So you know it's not going to be where any of the C's and T's are. Uh, so there are 14 paths with non-zero probability, and I've shown the six highest scoring paths. And I think that's all the different possible G's that could be at the five prime splice site. There are six possibilities. If you could all of the probabilities of each of those paths, and so we can identify uh, the best one. The best one has that five prime spice site at the fifth G. Oops. So this is uh, an example where we can actually enumerate all the paths that had non-zero probability. That's very unusual. So for working with uh, protein sequence alignment, there are a really very large number of paths. There's so many uh, possible state sequences that we couldn't possibly enumerate them. And so again, we resort to a dynamic programming algorithm, in this case called the Viterbi algorithm, um, which is guaranteed to find the most probable path, uh, most probable state path given a sequence and a hidden marker model. Um, and it's quite similar to the uh, algorithms that I showed you for, or I sort of d gave you the names for, for standard sequence alignment. Um, the sort of a key idea that was had back in the uh, 70s or 80s has been used over and over again. Professor, um, mm -hmm. so it's clear the intuition here. Now, 
are those values significant? Is minus 43.90 uh -huh. different from minus 43.45? I mean, when you're multiplying... It's a good question. Uh -huh. Yes, that's... Yeah. I mean, it's a good question. I think significant... Um, and how confident are we that, you know, this one path that has the, the highest probability is that really the right choice? It's not so different from I minus mean, 41.22, is not so different from minus 41.71. And what's nice is that in this probabilistic framework, we can actually sort of calculate our confidence in, in that, that model. Um, we can simply uh, compute the probability that uh, that G, that fifth G, was emitted from a five prime splice site, and we can compare that number to essentially uh, the probabilities of the sum of the probabilities of all the state parts. We can sort of normalize it, uh, and that's actually what's shown in this posterior decoding. So uh, even though that difference is very small, we actually end up with a probability of 46% that that fifth G is where the five prime splice site is um, versus 28% for the sort of next most likely probability. And we can just calculate all of this. Um, and so that tells you that even though that difference in the log probabilities is, is quite small, it leads to a reasonable difference in the posterior decoding. So when we compute... Uh, calculation that I just described to you. Um, so for this problem, we could just sort of reason out how to get to that posterior decoding. So that's just the probabilities of, of the, these different um, assignments. Uh, there are uh, sort of other dynamic programming algorithms that we have to use, called uh, amusingly the forward and backward algorithms when we're dealing with larger problems in order to make that calculation. But I guess what I want to sort of reinforce is the idea that because this is a fully probabilistic model, we can literally just count everything. And so we can get these confidence values. Uh, it's, all, it's all computable. Um, is that, are there any other questions or? No? Okay. All right, thanks. So, uh, I've shown you this toy example, this is a very simple toy example. Um, actually, uh, for protein sequences where hidden Markov models are used is to construct these fam alignments for protein families. And this is the homepage of a database called PFAM, which is where you can find all of these protein sequence alignments. Uh, there's something like 16,712 uh, protein families. Uh, in the latest release, which was in March 2017. And basically, these are huge alignments of protein sequences. And they're constructed by starting with a small seed alignment for each protein family. Uh, I have a picture here of the seed alignment for hemoglobin, or part of the seed alignment for hemoglobin. So this is uh, the first section of that alignment. Um, sort of wrapped around, and I've shown you some number of sequences here. There's typically about 70 or 100 sequences in a seed alignment, and these are constructed manually, so by human. They were all constructed at some point, given what we knew about the structure of the proteins involved, and um, functionally important. So you can see in that alignment that some amino acids are really quite conserved, and those are indicated in, 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 in purple. Um, well, I say that, the purple ones are actually those amino acids that are hydrophobic in character. And you can see that the hydrophobicity is sort of um, conserved through those columns are in yellow. These P's and the glycines are in orange. Uh, so the colouring is trying to indicate some information about the type of amino acid. And you can also see these rows that have H's in every so often in this alignment, and those are secondary structure uh, assignments. And those are used also in construction of these seed alignments. So once you have a, a seed alignment, the idea is that you can use that to build a hidden Markov model. Um, this is just the PFAM page for hemoglobin, which has some information 
in the main tab about the protein. Uh, but if you look on the left-hand side, you see you can actually sort of uh, look at the hidden marker model that was built from the seed alignment, and then you can use that model to put it in sequences from the database. So even though the seed alignment has only 70 or 100 sequences in it, you can see that this PFAM family has 4,699 sequences in it. Um, and in fact, there are alignments available uh, for this family that have as many as 20,000 sequences in them. And all of those sequences are thought by the hidden Markov model to be uh, similar to hemoglobin or the globin family. And so I, what I skipped over on that slide just now was um, a sequence logo. So once you have a hidden Markov model, it tells you something about the frequency with which each amino acid occurs at each site in your alignment. We saw that even with that little toy hidden Markov model with the exon and the intron, uh, it's basically looking at the emission probabilities. Um, so here in these logos, the letter height uh, is telling you something about how often each amino acid occurs at each position, and um, the stack height, the total height of each column, is telling you something about the relative entropy of that column. And these logos are, are so useful because they give you a very fast overview of the hidden marker model that underlies an alignment. And so you can see the hidden marker models for all of the PFAM, uh, the, the logos rather, for all of the PFAM hidden marker models um, simply by looking on this website. Uh, so basically, all I wanted to emphasize is that we have a huge amount of information available in this nice website called PFAM. And you can actually download the whole thing from the FTP site very easily. And I wanted to sort of go back to this slide that I showed you yesterday that made the point that now that we have this large amount of information, a large amount of sequences and corresponding structures, surely we should be able to use that to say something about uh, how proteins fold. So we sort of pointed out that this, this problem of going from the linear sequence to the unique 3D structure is sort of a self-assembly problem, it's, it's very difficult, right? Being able to solve the physics is not easy. And we discussed uh, these different physical interactions yesterday. These are components that people put into molecular dynamics uh, simulations, which they often try and use to simulate protein folding, so they're trying to literally calculate all of the physics here. They're using Newton's equations of motion, uh, which I sort of shown in that little schematic on the bottom of the slide. Basically, you want to take all of the atoms and their positions at any given time, evaluate the forces on every atom, and perform this sort of uh, integration, essentially, this time-stepping. Um, and because there are all of these different components, you know, um, we have to perform a large number of, of calculations, basically, for every single time step. Uh, each picosecond of simulation time requires something like 500 iterations of, of the cycle that's shown. Um, and so if we have something like 50,000 atoms, because we have atoms in the protein, of course, there are also solvent atoms in the simulation, um, we need something like 25 million evaluations. So this is why it's hard uh, even to simulate at this level, where you've ignored any kind of quantum effects, um, and we typically make, we're making approximations that these are the only forces involved, um, you can only simulate as much as a millisecond. So the state of the art, uh, roughly speaking, uh, is, I would say, um, at something called DESRED, so DESRES, it's a sort of protein folding institute, if you like, which is run by David Shore. They've built, he accelerates uh, the execution of molecular dynamic simulations. Um, and you can see that this is a paper they published in Science quite recently. They're able to sort of, if you like, these very small proteins. Um, to a reasonable degree of accuracy. And you can see the time scales here. There's a number of microseconds 
and they're able to uh, simulate. Um, even with this special uh, supercomputer, which they built specially for this purpose. So essentially, solving this problem by just computing things is a long way off. Um, a millisecond is the, the longest that they could do. And the problem is that when you carry out an electrodynamic simulation, you really want to sample the ensemble. So you want to carry out the same simulation many, many times, find out what happens um, on, uh, on average, essentially, or what happens um, over these repeated instances. And so uh, you're very limited as to what you can do. So, yeah, there are also um, these sort of schemes that people have for harvesting computer time by um, convincing people at home. There's a project called Folding at Home where people can contribute uh, their computers, CPU cycles while they sleep to sort of trying to fold proteins. Um, and this is a, you know, the idea that you can somehow help find a cure by contributing your, your, your sort of computer's time um, to protein folding. And there's also uh, people have released this game called Fold It, where people solve puzzles to try and structure. So people have really spent a lot of time on this problem of trying to predict the structure of proteins, and we still haven't solved it. So I want to get back to this idea, perhaps we could take this ensemble of sequences uh, to build a probability model. Of course, what I've told you about so far are first order. Oh, yes. So, uh, Lucy, uh, what happens if uh, one uh, inputs intrinsically disordered proteins into these dynamics program? What does it do, actually? What does it reveal if there is a large enough fraction of the protein that is does not have a structure, what do these programs end up doing? Um, that's a good question. Um, I guess I would say my uh, suspicion, this is not something that I really know the answer to, my suspicion is that you would get a large ensemble of structures, essentially. So you have this big a range of structures. I don't, I mean, you like to think that they wouldn't predict that you end up with a single static structure because biologically that isn't what's happened. Of course, these programs are sort of trained. I mean, these programs use force fields which are optimized uh, based on many, many structure, uh, proteins that have, you know, um, through, sort of ordered 3D structures. And so it's not totally clear to me what they would do if you put in a structurally disordered protein. Okay, thank you. Um, I, I worry they've kind of been overfit, if you like, to the data for structured proteins. Um, yeah, but it's not an experiment that I've tried. Um, yeah, I think it would be interesting. So we have these first order models, right, where we're simply asking that the model matches the distribution of amino acids seen at each sequence position. So remember I showed you those um, sequence logos, they tell you something about the distribution of amino acids at each sequence position, and a first order model will just try and match those single site statistics. And hidden Markov models are good examples of these first order models. So they encode that central assumption that different sequence positions uh, evolve independently of one another, and there are no interactions between them. We can sort of ask, does this model tell us anything about protein structure and function? Now, clearly this model tells us, or we know, the residues that are close in sequence will be close in 3D structure, right? They're connected by a polypeptide chain. Um, but basically, the frequency of amino acids at each site tells us something about the conservation level. It doesn't provide much information about the 3D structure. But this is sort of a, an empirical observation that uh, residues on the inside of a protein tend to be more conserved than residues on the outside. And so you can sort of get to, you can get some information um, from these sort of uh, independent sites models, but it doesn't tell us a huge amount about which positions are next to each other in structure. So how can we get to knowing something about 3D structure and function? I guess I would suggest that we need to abandon and then these first order models and consider models in which we allow there to be interactions between the sequence positions. So we're going to abandon this assumption that different sequence positions evolve independently of one another. And 
I'm going to show you this sort of toy uh, scheme to indicate why this might, this, this, this might be relevant. In this wild-type protein, we have uh, a nice interaction, a salt bridge between these two amino acids. So there's a lysine and an aspartic acid that are oppositely charged. And the wild-type protein, that salt bridge forms and it helps hold that protein together. Now, we might have a loss of function mutation where an aspartic acid mutates to an arginine, it changes sign, and so that salt bridge is lost, and that might result in an inactive version of the protein. But that single mutant that's inactive could be rescued by a compensatory mutation at the other site, so the lysine were to also mutate and happen to mutate to a negatively charged amino acid, we could restore that salt bridge. And so in the bottom corner of the slide is a functional double mutant. Right? We've had this sort of we've gone through this, 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 this loss of function intermediate, but we've been rescued by that second mutation. And so you have this new functional version of the protein. So this is an example of how mutations at different sites in a protein might depend on each other. And we might think about this as a constraint on the mutations that can be accepted as in induced by the requirements of 3D structure and function. This is you know, just the salt bridge has sort of imposed this requirement, but it means that essentially at these two positions in the sequence, we're either going to see the wild type sequence, the D and the K, or we might see that functional double mutant, the R and the D. We won't see that loss of function intermediate. We won't see the RK pattern because that protein didn't work. So we're going to assume that it's sort of been um, selected out of the sequence record. So if we have this feature that we only see either the wild type or the double mutant, then we expect that there's going to be a correlation between these two columns in the sequence alignment. Okay, so we can see the sort of a statistical pattern um, caused by that structural constraint. And you know, you might sort of say, well, this is all very well, this is just a silly toy model. But if we look back at that hemoglobin alignment that I showed you yesterday, um, we can actually see that even among this small set of sequences, we already have an example of a double mutation. So we either see um, the version at the top above the purple line, where we have an N and a K as, as the pair, or we see uh, the H and the Q. So the positive charge is kind of moved from the second position to the first position as we go across that line. Um, as you look at this alignment a bit more, you'll see some other examples too. And of course, amino acids can co vary for many reasons, but one reason might be that there's actually an interaction uh, between those amino acids that's necessary either for the structure or the function of the protein. And of course, what we'd like to do is to start off by observing these correlations and these sequence alignments and use them to make uh, predictions or inferences about the structure and function of the protein. So we have to ask this question, can we invert the correlations from the sequence data to provide information about, to start with anyway, a 3D protein structure? So of course, if we're going to do this, the first thing that we need is a way of measuring pair correlations in our sequence alignment, right? So we need to construct a matrix, essentially. And in my toy example, it's just going to be six by six, this matrix but we're going to measure the correlation between every possible pair of columns in a sequence alignment. We might, for example, use the mutual information for each pair of columns. And we want to look for large values in that matrix. And uh, we're going to sort of make the prediction or a hypothesis that large values correspond to contacts in 3D structure. So this is an exercise that we can carry out at any um, given protein of interest. So I'm going to ask this question, are the most correlated residue pairs close in 3D protein structure? And I'm going to examine this for a particular protein. This is a protein called RAS. 
the small GGPAs. Um, and here I'm showing you the answer. So you, this is a contact map for RAS. Uh, a contact map is basically a binary matrix that you can construct from a 3D structure. So I have a crystal structure for RAS, which I've taken from the PDB. It has the code 5P21. And I've literally constructed this matrix by taking every pair of sequence positions that is close in a 3D structure and putting a one in the appropriate place in this, in this matrix. So this matrix is all sequence positions in RAS. There's 166 by all sequence positions. And there's a one whenever the two amino acids are close in the 3D structure. And so you'll see straight away that there's ones down the diagonal of this matrix. And that's because the residues that are close in the sequence are also close in the structure because they're constrained by the polypeptide chain. And by close here, I simply mean that the two C alpha atoms of those amino acids are less than eight angstroms apart. So it's a reasonably generous definition of close. And you can see that there are quite a number of residues close to the diagonal, and then further away from the diagonal, there, there are fewer uh, ones in this matrix, and that's because uh, the amino acids that are further apart in the sequence are less likely to be close in structure. Um, so I, this is the answer. I want to be able to find these ones uh, by looking at correlations in the sequence alignment. So I'm going to start by taking a sequence alignment for RAS, in this case, it has something like 15,000 sequences in it. I'm going to compute the mutual information of every pair of columns using the equation I showed you on the previous slide. So I just calculate this. I just count up um, the frequencies of the amino acids and the pairs of amino acids in all of these columns. And I'm going to plot the pairs of columns with the highest scores on this matrix. And so here I've just put the residue pairs with the 150 highest mutual information values. And you can see that they're sort of constrained to lie very close to the diagonal, which is sort of interesting. Um, and they seem to be in particular parts of the protein, sort of towards the beginning and towards the end. If I add some more pairs, so now there's 250 residue pairs on here, I can see that they're still sort of concentrated in these parts of the protein and moving away from the diagonal a bit. Um, and not really matching the blue uh, ones in my contact map. So I'd like the red spots to perfectly overlay the blue spots, and it's not looking great. And if I put uh, 500 residue pairs on this plot, I can see that I'm really not doing a very good job at all. So you know, I want the red squares to find the blue points to predict the contacts, and it's not working. So why is this not working? Well, I actually think this is a very interesting question. Why does this fail? I'm going to tell you an answer today, which um, I believed for a reasonable amount of time, I believed for a good few years. Um, well, I was always slightly troubled about it. And tomorrow, I'm going to tell you a different answer, which I now believe. Um, although, you know, these things are sort of I think it's a good question. But the answer I'm going to tell you today is that we need to think about all of the amino acids in this protein. So I have this KD pair that I showed you earlier. They're close in my little toy protein, so I expect them to be highly correlated, right? And that's fine. But of course, there are other amino acids. So the K is also close to an E, which you can see, and the, and the D is also close to an R. So I also expect to see correlations between those columns in a sequence alignment. But of course, this is just correlation, right? So this just means that every time the E changes, the E column changes, I expect the K column to also change. Every time the K column changes, I expect the G column to also change. And so there's a transitive property here, which means that I'm also going to see a correlation between the E column and the D column, and likewise also for all of the pairs of columns. And so I sort of expect to see this sort of block structure in my correlation matrix, um, where I have high entries, even if the two amino acids aren't close in structure, so the E and the R here aren't close in this structure, even though I've got a high correlation score. Um, and actually, if I look at the data, which is sort of on the left, I am seeing this sort of block structure. And so 
perhaps this is the problem. And so how can I get around this problem? Well, what I really want, of course, is just the causal pairs. I want the pairs that are cor sort of correlated because they're next to each other in structure. And so um, I basically want to find probability model uh, that somehow ca captures all of my data. But so I want to be able to model the single site frequencies and the pair frequencies that I see in my data. These are the constraints. I want my model to satisfy these constraints, but I also want to choose the maximum entropy or least constrained model. So if I write down the equation for the entropy S, I want to maximize that. And it turns out that it gives me this particular functional form, the probability that the sequence is part of the family. Um, this equation is basically an equation for an Ising model. You might recognize it. Um, or in this case, the equation for a POTS model, because I have, instead of two states, I have uh, 20 states or 21 states, depending on how you count. And the key point is that I need to be able to infer these parameters, H, I, and E, I, J, the single site parameters and the, the pairwise weights, E, I, J. And this is where I'm really waving my hands. If I make some kind of, I mean, field approximation, and I assume the couplings are small relative to the fields, and I wave my hands a lot, then I can infer all of these EIJ parameters in one step by simply inverting the observed covariance matrix. So um, the, the experiments I showed you before, I was using mutual information, uh, which is basically uh, like the covariance as my metric. And this is telling me that instead I should be using the inverse of a covariance matrix. So if I try that, then it turns out that I can do a much better job of uh, finding uh, the entries of the contact map. So now that contact map I'm showing you is in, is in gray. So that's the, the crystal structure data. I want to be able to predict that crystal structure data. Um, so the mutual information version is shown below the diagonal of this plot. And you can see it doesn't do a good job at all of predicting those contacts. But this global model, which uh, I've explained to you, uh, involves computing the inverse covariance matrix does a much better job of finding these contacts. Uh, the red points are doing a good job of overlaying the gray points. And so I'm somehow able from my large sequence alignment and my statistical analysis of that large sequence alignment to predict uh, these contacts in 3D structure. So when we saw this, we were really very surprised and it suggested that there might be enough information here to actually specify the structure of the protein. And it's sort of, you might try and ask that question theoretically, like, do I have enough information to, to constrain the 3D structure? Um, I don't know how to do that. So instead, we decided to ask that question empirically, uh, by which I mean we literally took the unfolded polypeptide chain so this is an extended polypeptide chain. We added predicted secondary structure to that chain. So it basically means we took the chain, we sort of put helices at various places where they were predicted to be and beta strands at other places where they were predicted to be. And now we have this hypothesis that the high scoring pairs, according to our inverse covariance matrix, will be close in structure. So we're simply going to constrain the distance between the residues in each pair. So if I look at my global model matrix, wherever I have a red spot, I'm going to enforce the condition that these two sequence positions should be close in 3D structure. My close, we simply said that the C alpha atoms had to be more than four angstroms, but less than seven angstroms apart in a 3D structure. And so that leaves us with a sort of a geometry problem, basically. We need to take this extended sequence and arrange it to satisfy all of these distance constraints. And it turns out that fortunately, people have developed software that will do that. There's a piece of software you can get online called CNS Solve. Uh, CNS stands for crystallography and NMR system. Basically, these distance constraints are really quite similar to the kind of information people obtain from uh, NMR experiments in particular. So 
uh, back in the 80s, some people called Havel and Crippen had developed an algorithm called distance geometry that would take a set of distance constraints and um, enforce them uh, on a polypeptide chain to produce a 3D structure. And so that software already existed, and we could simply take that software and apply it to this problem. And when we did that, and we found that actually we ended up with predicted 3D structures that were really very similar to the crystal structures that are contained in the PEB. So this is the example. Um, this is an example of an RNA binding domain. It's a small protein. It's only 67 residues, and on the right-hand side, I've showed the observed crystal structure, um, which is in the PDB. It has the code 1G2E. And um, on the other side of the slide, I've shown our predicted structure, which is obtained using that correlation analysis. And you can see that there are differences between the predicted structure and the, the crystal structure, but these differences are not huge. Um, they correspond to an RMSD of just under three angstroms between the two structures. And um, because this was, in particular, because this was very fast to compute, um, the fact that we get so close to the real structure was really surprising. And that's a small protein. Um, it turned out we could also do this for larger proteins. So we had to go with this protein, RAS, uh, which I showed you the contact map for a few minutes ago. So this is like 160, well, we had 161 residues in the polypeptide chain that we were using. And um, we were, again, around well, three and a half angstroms C alpha RMSD from the observed crystal structure. So again, there are slight differences between these two structures, but the beta strands in our predicted structure were positioned well enough that we could actually predict the correct registration. So, um, these beta strands form sheets, as I explained to you yesterday, and we could correctly sort of line up the strands to form the sheets that you see in the real structure. And what's interesting is that actually uh, the one exception was the first beta strand, um, which was actually shown recently to exist in two different conformations, one of which was a conformation in the crystal structure, and the other conformation was a, the conformation that we found in our predicted structure. And it's sort of interesting because it suggests that perhaps these constraints that we can obtain from the evolutionary sequence data uh, reflect uh, a reality that wasn't found in, in the crystal structure. So if we are able to do this for uh, a large number of globular proteins, um, basically we needed something like a thousand sequences in the sequence alignment available in the protein family database in order for this to work well. Um, but this did work well for surprisingly large proteins. I think there's one on this slide which is as large as 278 residues, which is far beyond the size of structures that you can predict using the sort of molecular dynamics approaches that I've, I've told you about earlier today. So in the last few minutes, I want to sort of talk about what we saw a few years ago as the ultimate challenge which is transmembrane proteins. So why are transmembrane proteins such an important challenge? Well, they're very hard to find the structure of experimentally, right? These proteins are not soluble. They exist in the membrane. And so that means that it's very difficult to actually crystallize uh, these proteins. So in addition, it's also very hard to express these proteins in high throughput as you can, soluble uh, proteins. Lucy, just a moment. Yeah. Uh, you yeah, have please. 10 minutes from now. Yeah, yeah, that's good. OK. That's, that's good, thanks. Thanks, thanks, Lucy. Um, but these are important drug targets. Uh, more than 40% of drug targets are transmembrane proteins. And it's also an exciting arena for us because um, we can really do no prediction uh, with transmembrane proteins. And that's because there were many families which had large numbers of sequences that had no solved structure. So we started with this beta-2 adrenergic receptor. And here, there was a solved structure. So we can compare our predicted contact to the, the, um, to the contact map of that structure. So you can see the red overlays the blue um, 
really quite nicely. And in fact, transmembrane protein turned out to be somewhat easier because we have the constraint that we know something about where the each sequence position is predicted to be in the membrane. So you can do a, a pretty accurate prediction of where the sequence positions will end up. Will they be sort of in the membrane or out of the membrane? Um, and that provides extra information uh, which you can use to, to filter your predicted contacts. So this is a seven transmembrane GPCR family member, and um, this is a comparison between our predicted structure and the solved crystal structure. So our predicted structure is shown in purple, and the, crystal, the solved crystal structure is shown in gray, and there are clearly issues, particularly um, at the, 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 the non-transmembrane part, so the two ends of the protein, the top and the bottom, our prediction doesn't match the crystal structure very well, but uh, the transmembrane helices did come out very nicely, and it's just three angstroms, C alpha RMSD from the crystal structure. And so again, we can do this for a number of transmembrane proteins for which the structure had been solved, and they generally worked quite nicely. And this so sort of emboldened us to make predictions for eleven protein families. Um, for which no homologous uh, structures have been solved. And uh, these are the predictions that we made a few years ago, back in 2012, and I promise tomorrow to give you an update on how well, some of these structures have now been solved. So uh, at the time we had to just make these predictions and publish them, but now we have some idea of how well we did. and. Um, yeah, I'm happy to finish there today and to take any questions that you might have. Thanks. Yeah. Yes. Uh, so, how do you see your predictions match up to homology models? Um, so, essentially, we're making predictions uh, in cases where we have no homology models. So in the cases where we, we do have homology models, I mean, um, it's a good question. I think for transmembrane proteins, our predictions are, were significantly better than homology models. Um, but the thing is that essentially homology models are capturing variation within a family, right? We, can, we do have some information about the changes that happen within a family. We're basically mainly producing one structure for the family, okay? So... It's not quite true because I can sort of build structures using subalignments. So I can build structures using sort of particular subalignments within a family, and they will be different, and they'll give me some more specific information, which is more like what you get from a homology model. But we're sort of, we're sort of, um, it's just somehow a slightly different scale, or at least that's where the real power is. Um, yeah, I think. What would be really powerful is if you could work out how to use this approach to do a better job of homology modeling. Um, I didn't know how to do that yet, but I think that's um, that's the sort of, yeah. So you mean something like uh, predicting for one protein and then taking that, uh, uh, using that as a framework for others in the same family, like that you are saying when you're- Yeah, I mean something like that. Or I mean also being able to sort of, um, to, to, to gather information from alignments of different sizes. So you can imagine making a very small alignment that's very tight around your protein of interest. And um, because that alignment doesn't have very much diversity in it, you the information you get will be very, very noisy. But there might be some information you can gain from that small alignment. And then you can make progressively larger alignments and get, I think, different information from these different levels of alignment and combine that information to give you a model that's more specific than the model we're constructing at the moment. Um, but I haven't figured out how to do that yet. So I think that would be that, that would be information that you could actually then add to a homology model. It would be a different source of information that might mean you could actually do a better job of homology modeling. Um, but what I'm showing you right now is really a, a technique for de novo structure prediction. So it's sort of uh, providing a sense, I mean, in a sense, it's like, you could use this in a case where you didn't have a crystal structure, and then you could put homology modeling on top of this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and that would be interesting. Thanks.
Yes. Uh, how is defined when we predict 3D structure of protein? We sequence uh, predict uh, helix region or beta sheet or other loop region. Mm -hmm. How? Okay, sorry, what was the question? Hello. How can you what? Sorry. Uh, how it is defined? Ki which sequences predict uh, build uh, which region of 3D structure protein like uh, helix, loop, or uh, beta sheet region? So this is uh, using the secondary structure prediction algorithms that I, I mentioned a bit yesterday. So we use this algorithm called Cypred, um, which a guy called David Jones developed. Um, he's based at UCL in London. Um, and it's basically uh, an, an algorithm that uses some machine learning, essentially, to learn patterns for where the, you know, which sort of small sections of sequence likely correspond to a helix or a loop or a beta strand. Prediction is a really well-developed area, and there's a lot of data to train on because we have these 100,000 solved structures in the PDD. And so you can basically build a model that will do a reasonably accurate job of that prediction. And so that's what we used. Question. So um, you showed uh, the Blossom 50 matrix, and that's probably yes. using the inputs from globular and transmembrane proteins. Is there a dedicated? Uh, uh -huh. Is there a dedicated matrix for transmembrane zone protein only and? Uh, yes, yeah, so, so, so that, that's a good question, um, and I, I believe that uh, people have made substitution matrices that are specific to transmembrane proteins, um, and they've also made sort of secondary structure prediction tools that are specific for transmembrane proteins, because um, you, you want to predict both the secondary structure in terms of whether it's a helix or a beta strand, and also whether it's inside the membrane or outside the membrane. So you end up predicting the topology um, of the, the protein relative to the membrane. So which parts are in the membrane, which parts are inside the cell. If it's a, a cell membrane, which parts are outside the cell. But yeah, people have substitution matrices that are specific to transmembrane proteins. Um, uh, yeah, those, those definitely exist, although I couldn't offhand tell you the name of them. Um, but if you Google for them, I'm sure that people have done this. I mean, people have also made substitution matrices that are specific, for example, to antibodies, or to all sorts of classes of proteins. Because now as we have more and more data, um, you, you can carry this out. Uh, this calculation out quite quite easily. Um, and they do find that the, the matrices end up differing uh, significantly between these different classes of proteins. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, yes. so um, uh, so one of the things you've shown in these contact residue maps is that uh, you have more uh -huh. than, you have basically more than two or three residues uh, contacting each other in, in yes. certain parts of the protein. Um, yeah. So the thing is that, so uh, when you think about it in terms of mutual information, you're basically capturing only pairwise uh, couplings. Yeah. And ideally what you want to do is you want to capture some kind of like higher order correlation between yeah. So, uh, so, so somehow that's exactly what this Ising model kind of thing that you're doing does. Like, is that's a way of somehow capturing these higher order correlations, which. Well, I mean, the Ising model is kind of approximating some higher order correlations sort of via the second order uh, terms, right? But really, what you'd like to do, I guess, is actually parameterize or, or fit higher order parameters uh, from the data. Um, of course, that's difficult because you know we have thousands of sequences, but we don't have typically hundreds of thousands of sequences. So, so we still, you know, we still need more data, I think, to reliably fit those higher order terms. Um, there's an alternative approach, which is to uh, sort of consider epistasis. Basically, if you have lots and lots of of, of mutant variants of a protein, and you can um, evaluate with an assay the phenotype of all those mutant variants, then you can compute epistasis terms and try and use those to infer the higher order interactions. Um, and there's a paper on the archive quite recently uh, by Rama Ranganathan and uh, Frank Pollock, which tries to do this um, for, for, for data that they generated. And I think it's really an interesting direction. Um, and I think we need more data, basically. In order to, to, to do this. But I think uh, it's a really interesting idea. 
I think the higher order terms are clearly important. Um, you know, we're sort of messing them up basically with this approach, right? It's, 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 it, there are clearly higher order terms and, and we don't approximate them well uh, with, with, with this approach. Um, and, and their work is really interesting. It was published within the last few months, or put on the archive at least, within the last few months. Um, yeah, so I can send that reference along. Um, sure. Yeah, it's really interesting. Uh, it's a good question. Uh, yeah. I have a question. Uh, so when you uh, talk yeah, about the structure, uh, the stru structure for protein inside a cell, because there is a lot of mm -hmm. dynamics around that protein. I mean, there are molecules coming and bumping into it. So how how yeah, absolutely. how how stable is that uh, structure? I mean, does it like rim? I mean, the structure is quite stable, or like does it vary? Or uh, it's a really it's a really good question. Um, I wish I knew the answer better. Um, we're sort of starting to get a window onto this with, uh, I guess, I want to say with um, some of the cryo-EM techniques, uh, because with cryo-EM you can capture a, a single protein or a protein complex in a range of different conformations, because you sort of, you freeze it very suddenly, and then you sort of have this, this, this patch um, with all of the, with sort of these versions of the protein in different conformations trapped in it. And so I think that's starting to provide some information about uh, the range of conformations that different proteins or protein complexes adopt. But um, the only other source of information we have is, is NMR, which, which does give us some idea about the dynamic range, in particular NMR using these um, sort of specifically designed pulse sequences can provide information on the sort of millisecond timescales that, that are relevant for, for these large scale motions. But um, you know, there's some interesting work that's been done for particular proteins, particular protein complexes, but it's really an exciting area that's beginning to, to open up, I think, with the sort of experimental innovations that are being made. It's a, it's a, it's a really important question. Um, yeah, I, I kind of can't give you a, a, a general answer because there's sort of so many different, you know, examples. I mean, there's any, everything from very static structures that, that hardly move to, to wildly dynamic structures that completely change shape. Um, I, people have started to use this correlated uh, mutation approach to try and give some information at least about the, the different conformations that a protein can occupy. Because often you find trapped in these, uh, these, these sort of predicted contact maps, so the reds, dots on this plot, you might find uh, predicted contacts for two different structures um, in the same protein family. Of course, that could correspond to two different static structures uh, occupied by different family members or family members that can switch between these two structures. And so some interesting examples have been sort of uh, published where people have functions of all kinds of confirmations of proteins and actually managed to experimentally show that they're functionally relevant. Uh, so it's interesting because, of course, you know, this is all from evolutionary data uh, and the, the constraints that we're finding sort of reflect the fact or can reflect the fact that the protein has to change uh, conformation in its normal function. Um, I think that's also a really interesting area uh, to, 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 that, that should be explored further, essentially. Um, how, because basically what I'm doing here is I'm, I'm binarizing this, this model. So I'm saying that either pairs are sort of have, have high scores or, or low scores. Of course, they're actually, you know, I've, I've made it sort of binary, but it was actually, they had real numbers to start with. And you might ask if those real numbers correspond to some kind of physical interaction between the amino acids. So you might try and actually sort of infer a model for the protein from this approach. Uh, I think we're, we're not there yet. But I think it, it is interesting because that kind of those physical interactions might give us some information about how the protein actually moves. Um, yeah. Thanks, Professor. One little question. So, sure. Trying to explain these beautiful patterns. Um, has there been some some work on? Okay, so let's put it like this. You have here oh. a matrix which is given by the distance, right? And the covariance of the mm -hmm. of the amino acid, you see. But there needs to be some continuity of the biophysical properties if you uh -huh. if you walk 
along the protein. Does that make yeah. sense? So, sure. Could could so it? You mean be? The, the, they're not either. The new muscles are not either close or far, right? It's continuous. There's sort of a continuum of of distances, and I've, I've sort of artificially divided them into these categories of being close and 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 far. Right. Yeah. Right. So, um, let me paraphrase it. So, could you maybe explain um, this mm -hmm. structure? Thinking of different layers of this matrix, uh -huh. given by biophysical properties. So. Yeah, that's an interesting thought. So you're saying? I'm, I'm saying that um, maybe there is a restriction in the polarity of uh -huh. a helix, right? Uh -huh. Which constrain um, the set of possible mutations you have. So maybe you're, mm -hmm. you're yeah, kind sure. of, I mean, so I know that if you if yeah. you map the amino acids, you get kind of clusters of I mean, so yes, if you think of, of, of amino acids in their biophysical properties, you can cluster them, mm -hmm. and, and maybe those restrictions are, are happening there, you know? So this is just one picture yeah. where you think of the distance between them, but it's probably talking about yeah. those which are the, like true physical restrictions, I think. Yeah, so I th that's an interesting thought. I mean, solubility is one example. So solubility is a property so a physical property of the of the whole protein, essentially. So it, it implies a constraint somehow on all of the amino acids in the protein. Somehow overall, this protein has to be soluble enough. So I can't put too many hydrophobic amino acids on the surface. There's some kind of collective constraint that's implied by the need for the protein to be soluble that, that must somehow show up in an accurate model of the protein, I'd have, to have, I'd have to have in my accurate model some some very some very high order term that basically involved all the amino acids in the protein, and that somehow um, enforced the, the need to be soluble. And that's that's perhaps at the sort of the very end of the scale you're imagining. Have terms you know that reflect um, a single helix. The fact that I have this sort of periodic structure bonds between. Um, I guess the hydrogen ones are just are just backbone, but essentially I need to have, you know, perhaps one face of the helix is hydrophobic and one face is hydrophilic, and that would impose a, a different higher order constraint in the model um, on what mutations were were possible and which weren't. And so you can imagine, as you say, there sort of be constraints of every order, essentially. Um, so you, and those those should be terms, in, high order terms in the model that are currently missing. Um, but I mean, the problem is that I just I don't know how to parameterize those terms. So I agree with you. Yes, those terms should be there, um, but I don't know how to fit them, given the data that I have. That's a problem. But uh, yeah, I think what you're saying is is entirely right. There should be higher order terms in the model that reflect these biophysical, um, and it would be really interesting to, to to figure out a way of of finding those terms. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks.